Hello, souls and demons, and welcome to today's bonus episode. It's called Souls Like Second Cycle. It's the sequel to Souls Like. So if you haven't seen that, go ahead and check out the description I'm putting in the portal. Without further ado, sit back, grip your seats, and enjoy. Souls Like Second Cycle by Cecily 1987. The cycle repeated over and over and over. I'd wake up in the basement, make a little progress, just to be murdered, over and over. The concept of time faded as my suffering grew within this cruel game. Last I counted was cycle 452, and that was a long time ago. I will have to admit, I gave up for a while. The cycle broke me. I would just sit in the basement unresponsive to my surroundings, ignoring Jenny's questions until the giant freak would find me. The first dozen times he went straight for the kill, whacking me right across my head with a plethora of different weapons, usually something new every time he came in. That wasn't so bad. It was almost peaceful. I used that time to clear my mind. I got so good I could block out everything, even block out my nagging wife. Since I couldn't sleep, I used the times in the quiet basement to think, before he would storm in and murder me. But he got wise to my plan. He wouldn't go for the kill. He would torture Jenny. He would pull her apart and let me listen to her screams. I would try to shut them out. It was only temporary. The cycle would reset and she would be fine again. Then he started torturing me. He would bring a bag full of tools to cause me pain. This had more of an effect on me. How selfish was I to put Jenny through this when I couldn't handle it? And then there was the insistent ponderings of the suit-wearing devil. Every time I died, he took me into the foggy purgatory before the cycle repeated. He explained he hadn't frozen time, but a microsecond would have passed every time the cycle repeated. He told me the tragic story of his own life, how the day of judgment awaited him and his kind at the end of time. The devil expresses abject horror at this, so he used his powers to reverse time as much as he could. But alas, time still ticked, forward, slowly but surely. When I went in my state of depression, just sitting there doing nothing, he didn't react at first. He said a lot of his playthings hit the wall at some point, but when I refused to snap out of it for cycles, he told me lack of activity would forfeit my soul. This has happened to a couple of my playthings too, he chided me. There are more ways to agree to defeat than giving verbal confirmation. I had one plaything who would take his life every cycle, used a bag to suffocate himself. These words took a while to breach the fog in my brain. Wait, the nemesis was another player, I asked? Ah, uh, yes, very much so. I'm not as cruel as my brethren, though. Just like you have a chance to escape, he still has one. How? I almost screamed. The devil smiled and put his hand over his mouth. I only give players information, not quitters. Then I'll play! I yelled at him. A warm smile washed over his pointy face, and he let out a relieved sigh. Oh, good, good. Just remember, please do better this time. The cycle restarted and I sat up straight. I immediately grabbed a set of handcuffs I'd acquired from one of my cycles and scooted to an unconscious Jenny. I cuffed her hand to a metal pole running down the middle of the room. She was now in a long robe I'd found for her, but I couldn't have her following me. I stood up and ran to the trick wall I'd discovered in the basement. I pushed it open to reveal a short set of stairs leading up into the night sky. As I took the first step, I heard Jenny call after me. I ignored her. I stepped out into the estate property and looked around. I had the entire estate mapped out in my head. The chapel held the green key, which unlocked the graveyard. The graveyard held the blue key, which led to the cellar of the giant manor. The manor held the black key, which led into actual manor. 
and I hope the manor held the scarlet key, my chance to escape. I began to sprint towards the cellar of the mansion, at the middle of everything. I wore a pair of overalls with a utility belt with a crossbow and knapsack over my shoulder. I was still barefoot. None of the shoes I scavenged fit me. Like clockwork, the Rottweiler caught my scent and came barreling out of the bushes of the house. I had wrapped straps of leather around my left arm. I bent low and offered the dog my arm. He bit down on it and tried to shake me off my feet. Like a million times before, I pulled a K-Bar knife from my pocket and jammed it up through the dog's head. The dog whimpered and convulsed. I had felt terrible the first times I had done it. Worse than having to kill humans. But now I felt nothing. Just cold. I slung the dog off to fall dead to the ground and began walking to the cellar doors. I flung them back to release the same bats that always escaped into the night sky. The stairs went down into darkness. I ignored the torch on the wall. I had found a flashlight already. The flashlight did little to show the way down the 40-foot descent. It didn't matter. I knew the way through the wine cellar maze. I had turned its corners and dodged its traps. I walked right up to the cultists hiding in wait to kill me, only to kill them with brutal efficiency. The first one always jumped down from behind me with a fearsome yell. I would quick turn and put my K-bar in his neck before he could lift his heavy axe. The next one would wait for me to pass a dark alcove between the shelves before shooting me in the back with a crossbow. I snuck up to a reach to the shelf behind her and grabbed her by the throat to knife her too. I knew how to avoid the other five hiding in the dark. Then I would come to a door that led to the house. Two big bastards guarded it. I had fought them enough to learn who was the slower of the two. My crossbow zips right into the middle of the quicker one's dark hoodie, and he collapses like a sack of bricks. The slower one pulls a sharp hand scythe from his robes to meet my charge. I would scream his name at him. Teddy! He freezes for an instant for me to slice across his weapon hand. He drops the scythe with a yelp and steps back. Too late. I'm inside his reach and slash him across the throat with a brutal swipe. He dies quicker than usually. It must be because I'm angry. I run up to the locked door and produce the black key from my knapsack and open the door into the manor. It gets harder from here. Like cultists in armor or with poison knives. Maybe I can unlock the front door to the manor and save myself a trip through the cellar. A thunderous explosion erupts behind me. I turn to see the giant, with overalls and a plastic bag tied over his face, storming through a destroyed wine rack he just busted through. He delivers a crushing fist to the center of my chest, sending me busting through the unlocked door. I struggle for breath as he stalks up to stand over me. I dig the K-bar into his foot. He lets out a grunt of anger and reaches down to seize me by the neck and yank me up to eye level. Kill me, you son of a bitch! I wheeze at him. The sack on his face expanding and deflating rapidly with his angry huffing. I'm never going to give up like you, sack boy, I spit. This makes him mad. He reaches up and puts his nasty hand around my mouth, and with a jerk, painfully snaps my head to the side. I awake in the basement. Damn it. Time to try again. I use the next couple of cycles mapping out the manor. I do unlock the front door eventually, and get a sweet shortcut past the cellar. I kill a bastard with full plate armor. Now I'm wearing partial plate armor to not slow me down. Somehow the giant is in the manor now. He must have a skeleton key. I don't know how he bypasses all the locked doors. I can't outmaneuver him. He cheats so bad. He cheats. Maybe I should cheat. I go back into meditation for a couple of cycles. Jenny screams at me from her handcuffed position, but I ignore her and plan. When the giant asshole finds me, I don't give him the satisfaction of an easy kill. I taunt him about his plastic sack. I taunt him about how he gave up and I'm still going. He makes me pay for it. But I take a piece out of him each time. I never kill him but I make him bleed. I learn his tactics. I seek him out and go straight for him. 
Finally, when I think I've seen every move and counter, I prepare to enact my plan. If I open the gate door, I'm free, right? I ask the devil in the purgatory between cycles. He turns to me, curious. Yes, Terence, those are the rules. I mean, no BS. I don't need the key, I just need to get through. The devil laughs. Sure, my boy. But you know it's electrified, you can't climb it. I need your word, I yell at him. I just need to get through the scarlet door. A sly look crosses the devil's face. You have my word. I dare say you have my attention. The fire in your eyes is delicious. Let's restart the cycle, I say, cutting him off. He humps at me and waves for the cycle to repeat. When I was a kid, my father had a chess set game on the family computer. He taught me to play, and I could only make progress against the enemy AI when it was set to very easy. I would challenge myself by playing against the computer when it was set to expert. I wouldn't make it more than five turns before I was defeated. No matter how hard I tried, the AI knew all my moves in advance. You see, it was programmed to react to well thought out and measured moves. But I discovered I could last a lot longer if I would randomly place a piece every other turn. The computer would try to make sense out of nonsense. It would throw its whole plan off. That's where the AI failed. It didn't account for random human stupidity. It had plans and counterplans for everything, but not for a 10-year-old boy having fun. I needed to start having fun.